What kind of God do you believe in? That is today's question. You see, we always talk about do we believe in God? Do we not believe in God? But today, we want to raise the question of do we understand God in its fullest, at least as fully as we can? And what does that mean to believe in God? The big questions that hover uh, us today here at Spiritism Today. I am Dan Assisi. I will be your host for Spiritism Today. And we're really happy that you have taken some minutes out of your life to join us in this dialogue, so to say, in this reflection about God in general. You see, uh, us Spiritists like to bring a scientific, a philosophical, and an ethical perspective to everything we do. And in one of those things, is the evaluation of perhaps the most important question we can ask ourselves is, do I believe in God? I am of the idea that once we settle that question, we're halfway to tackling life's most difficult problems. But before we go through all these different ponderings and all these different reflections, we want to stop a little bit and frame our conversation with a little story. And behold, I give you an elephant. And God, in a way, is kind of like an elephant. Wait, let me explain. What do I mean by that? Well, I want to go back to histories that we find in the Buddhist, in the Hindu, and in the Jain traditions to better kickstart our conversation about God. In all of these um, uh, traditions, there is a wonderful story about an elephant that comes into a village. And that village has never seen an elephant before. The elephant comes at night. Not a lot of people understand what it is. And the elders of the village decide to build a tent around our elephant so that they can both save the elephant and study the elephant um, and make sense of what's happening. Next day, they gather a group of people and they decide that they are going to go into the tent and understand what the elephant is. So, and they do so. The first one goes in and being dark inside the tent, starts to make his way around the elephant and comes to the leg of the elephant. The other one go in and they go all in and come out. When they are starting to talk about what they experienced, Guess what happens? They have different experiences. So they say, well, the elephant was something really strong, like a pillar. And the other person who had gone in after said, no, 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 that's not, that's not what an elephant is. That's not what that animal is. That animal was sort of like a rope because they had grabbed the tail of the elephant. A third one then chimed in, that's not what I experienced at all. It was like a tree, like a moving tree because they had held onto the trunk in the dark. And yet, a fourth one chimed in, you guys are absolutely all wrong. What I felt that animal was, was a wonderful canopy that just came and brushed against me and, and made a, a whooshing sound full of wind because he had touched the elephant's ears. And another one still, because many had gone in to try to understand what animal that was, said, no, that, that, that animal, whatever it was, it was sturdy and huge. I was able to hug its midsection and, and it was about absolutely incredibly large and strong, which was very different than anybody else had heard. And the final one said, no, no, it was actually pointy and dangerous. If I had not watched out, it would have hurt me. And so the story goes, they debated for a very long time about what is it they had, that they had experienced. And why do we bring this elephant story to us because in a way, in our society today, God is the elephant in the room. God is different according to whom you ask. And it behooves us to try to understand what kind of God we believe in because that dictates how we behave. What do you mean, Dan? What do you mean? Well, it's simple. If you believe in a God that only favors a few over others, 
then it might make sense that you may not treat everybody the same. On the other hand, if you believe that God has come to all people, then we sort of have an ethical mandate to treat all people the same. Some people say God is love. Some people say God should be feared. So which one is it? And how do we make sense of that? And how does that apply to our lives? That's the topic for our next 15 minutes or so, if you can bear with me, uh, as we try to bring our spiritist perspective to the analysis of what God is. And if you're still standing, at the end, we may still entertain some questions as well. All right, so, the elephant is an interesting symbol for us and the story that goes with the elephant because it tells us a little bit about religion. You see, religion is how we connect to the spiritual, to God. And I want to make a distinction here because a lot of people don't often think about the act of being in an organized religion or what religion really is. If we go back to the original meaning of the word, religion from the Latin religare means to reconnect, reconnect us with divinity. And therefore, religion is an individual effort that we must do to reconnect with our Creator, whatever name we may call that Creator. And the name here is not as important as the essence. So today, we are going to be mentioning the word God, but it could be the One, the Tao, Allah, whatever it is that you hold in your heart to be most appealing to you. But again, we're going to be using the word God, so don't read anything into it other than we have to use a word. This is the word we're going to use today. But back to my point here, which is I want to make sure that we understand, is that religion is an individual activity. Organized religion, however, is a collective activity. Because when we come together and create religions, organized religions, whether you are a Protestant or a Catholic, whether you are evangelical or a Muslim, or whether you are a Buddhist or whatever it is that you want to call yourselves, that means that you have gotten together with a group of people that have a similar interpretation of what God is, or what religiosity is, and you have built a community around that. So that is an important distinction because you might not find, even within the same labels, the same experience. You might go to a church or a temple here that calls itself from one denomination, and you might be surprised to walk maybe three or four blocks and go to the same one from the same denomination and experience a different atmosphere and a different teachings altogether. And that takes place because people are involved. And every time people are involved, they have different interpretations. And so we really want to understand that to ask ourselves the question of whose version of God are we connecting to? Why do I say that? Because most of us learn and think about God through our organized religions, through our churches, through our synagogues, um, and maybe sometimes through our families, and they have been told their idea of God. Much the same way our villagers had their experience with the elephant and then passed that experiences of what the elephant was to their offsprings and their family. So it is only natural that during our learning process, we will hear from somebody else what something is. Now, the question is, should we hold on to those ideas forever, or should we stop to reflect and find our own? Why? Because religion, as we said, is an individualized activity. It's a connection between you and the maker and the creator. So it's important for you to have your understanding of what the creator and what God is. Otherwise, what you're really doing is you are connecting to other, spe other people's version of God. And I sometimes ask if that's the reason why some people are turned off to the idea of religion or spirituality in general, because they have been given somebody else's idea 
that they have not exactly analyzed or kicked the tires off, so to say, uh, and have not fully embraced. So going back to the very beginning and thinking and pondering what God is and how we connect to God is tantamount to the most important thing, in my opinion, that we can do in this lifetime. So we proceed. All right. Um, but, you know, it gets harder than that, actually, because once we start thinking that we are beginning to understand God, we also have to think about what does that mean to our lives? Is this just an exercise of theory and understanding? Is it just, just trying to figure it out, a nice definition that we're going to be happy with? Or are we actually going to use that in our lives? But as we addressed briefly in the beginning, whichever definition or whichever idea of God we have will be very important to how we behave. So, let's go on. So, we often hear within the Christian uh, tradition that we were created in God's image. And I always ask myself, what does that mean? Wh whose image? Again, to draw our point in. Um, imagine God for a second. What does God look like to you? When I was little, which was not that long ago, I like to tell myself, which is not true, but I like to tell myself that anyways, I imagine God as a man with a long flowing white, uh, white robe sitting in a really big chair with really long hair. I don't know why, but that's how I imagined God, and I was a little scared of God. But where does it come from? I have no idea. I don't remember anybody telling me that what it was, but that's what I imagined. It was only when I grew up and got a little older that I started questioning myself and realized that the idea of God, it's very different for everybody. Take a couple of examples that we find in our society nowadays. We have all seen the angry and vengeful God that sometimes we're told about in the Old Testament. Uh, and here is depicted in one of the paintings on the Sistine Chapel. We have also seen a more loving, fluffy cloud kind of God in other depictions of art in general. And we have also seen deities in different Eastern traditions that are, for instance, blue and have perhaps multiple limbs, symbolically speaking. And more recently as well, we have even seen Morgan Freeman as God dictating his edicts from heaven through emails, right? Um, so all of that to say that it is really hard to truly imagine God. It's really hard to truly comprehend God. So I think it makes it even more important for us to dive deeper into our own thoughts and our own experiences to try to make sense about what God is for us. Because although all these depictions of God can be said or valid because we don't know what God looks like, they might not be for you. And it's important that you find what works for you, right? So, what we propose in general is to face two important challenges. The first one is how do we overcome other people's perception of what God is? Because that's what we have been fed. And the other one is, how do we overcome our own perceptions of what God is? Because sometimes when somebody gives us a perception, the world gives us a perception from the outside, and we don't question it, and we let it sit, it sticks. And it stays there for a while. And we can't blame the world for that. We took it in. We accepted it. So we need to ask, and we should probably start asking, can we truly know God? How can we comprehend such a powerful idea? It's a really daunting task, I think. And again, one more time, if the name God triggers you in such a way because perhaps you were exposed to people who use the, the word God to push on others or even yourself, this, their own ideas, cast that aside. I like to take a pause and joke that saying that you can substitute God for G-O-D. You can call it the grand organizing designer of all things, the source of everything in the universe, if that helps you break that stigma. Or if you are having a little bit of a lighter day, you can use what I sometimes call the grand old dude approach. 
just make it a lot closer to you. Whatever it is, we could give ourselves permission to break away from the ideas of God and religion in general that stem from the belief of God that others have tried to impose us. And we should also not try to do the same to other people. It's important for us to also respect other people and not try to force our ideas on them. And so, in a roundabout way, what I mean to say is that self-reflection in anything that comes to us from the spiritual perspective is the number one requirement, along with discipline and discernment, for us to arrive at our own very definition of what, what God is and therefore what the universe looks like and, by consequence, what is it that our role in the universe is. So let's move forward. So our goal here is not just to learn from others, but also learn by ourselves with the help of others. It's also important to say that we are just not going to cast away everything that was ever given to us just because we are now understanding that maybe uh, those definitions don't work for us. That's not what we're saying. We're saying there's a lot of wisdom out there from different traditions, from different perspectives, from beautiful books. Um, so it's really important for us to leverage all of those, pick the sources that we feel jive with what we feel in our hearts, and act on that. But ultimately, the decision is still ours, but it doesn't mean that we have to shoo everybody's perspective away because it's also their perspective, so we respect that. And that's our goal for today. If we can do that, if we can find ourselves having reflected a bit about God and the idea of God and what He means to our lives, we will have achieved our goal. Okay, so let's do this. Let's kick into second gear and try to do just that. So, who can help us understand God? <coughs> well, we know that there are many different traditions, and they are all very valid. Us, in Spiritism, have also an added source. We have been, uh, through our research and through mediumship, the ability to add one more layer of knowledge to everything that we have had before from other religions. In Spiritism, we call mediumship. Uh, the ability to connect with the spiritual world in different days, it was called by different names. For instance, we used to have prophets back in the day, right? Today in Spiritism, we use the word mediums because we feel it's a little bit more accurate that they can translate and they can be the medium between the spiritual world and God and us. So we can ask the spirits, the good spirits. And we have done that through a series of scientific experiments and systematic approach that took place in the 1850s in France with a French educator, Hippolyte Léon Rivail, which we call Alain Kardec. That's a story for another time. But Alain Kardec had the opportunity, along with a group of people, to go around and ask the same question in different places to different people and different spirits. And if those answers that came from different places and different spirits that did not know each other connected and were similar, they were then compiled into a book, which later became the Spirits Book, uh, which is the core of Spiritism and contains a series of questions that Kardec, as an educator, decided to leave in its original format of questions and answers so that we could reach our own decisions with the answers. He tried to maintain a certain level of distance so that we would be able to make our own minds, which is what we suggest that we try to do today. And in the first uh, part of that book, called First Causes, we see uh, question number one, the most important question that drives everything in the book, which is, what is God? And I think the question is genius already by itself, because it's not who is God, but what is God? Because God is not a person. God has to be a force bigger than us. If God were a person, we would have seen God, we would have talked to God. But God is not a person, so what is God? And the good spirits reply, God is the supreme intelligence, the first cause of all things. So God is an intelligence, is an incredible force, beautiful, that it's hard for us to comprehend and has triggered everything else. Everything else comes from God. 
is the first cause. And the spirits go for, for, uh, forth and also tell us that it's really hard to understand God because we don't even have the words to understand such beauty. They tell us further down that human language is too impoverished, insufficient to define that which transcends human intelligence. Which makes sense if you think about it because sometimes even with things we experience on the day-to-day, -day, feelings and love, we struggle to find the words to express those things. And so it would only make sense that we would have a really difficult time fully expressing what God is because we'd, we can't even comprehend yet. As we grow in discernment and science and understanding, we're going to get closer and closer to it, right? Because God has given us a brain and we must use it. But we're not there yet. So it does mean that it makes the journey of perfectly pinpointing what God is very hard. Because how do you understand something that's so great and so farther from what you're experiencing, and how do you define it? It would be sort of like asking a kindergartner to, decide, to, uh, to uh, define for us what quantum physics is. There might be some explanations, they might be very poetic and entertainment, and the kindergartner might be on the right path, but he won't fully encapsulate all of it. And I feel like that's where we are today as a society. We know God is there, most of us do, we continue to try to understand what God is, but we struggle with fully comprehending God. So, what do we do? Well, we try to bring a little bit of a scientific perspective and understanding in spiritism and apply logic and reasoning and philosophy to truly understand things. So, if God is the original light, the light bulb of all things, Right? How do we dive in there? So our whole mind and understanding is predicated on God, um, and we're going to use the tool of spiritism to try to understand that, as we said. And as I mentioned before, uh, spiritism is a science which really deals with the, with the nature, the origin, and the destiny of spirit. So we are trying to understand in spiritism the spirit and what relation the spirit has to this world, which we know that we're not of, we're just temporarily here, and how that happens. And at the core of it, it's God. So, we believe that we cannot know God yet. But we can know about God. Even though we can't fully understand God perfectly, we believe that there are some things that we already understand about God that leads us there. You see... We have a growth mindset in Spiritism, which means that we are always evolving and always changing. So even though we don't understand it today, it doesn't mean that we won't be able to understand it tomorrow. Either um, you know, ourselves or society in general. So we keep on going. But even though we cannot grasp the essence of God today, we think that there are some clues, there are some things that may help us get to a better and more perfect understanding of God. And what are those? Well, let's look at some of God's attributes, some of God's qualities. What are the things that when we ask the good spirits and we think about it, that we think are characteristics of God? And let's take some time to look into that because that might help us understand uh, things in general. So the first one that I want to start with is a really hard one is the eternal peace, right? Uh, these, so eternity is a very difficult concept, concept to grasp, I feel, at least for me. My brain's still very small, and I struggle with that one. But I want to make a difference, too, between infinite and eternal. And that's why eternal is so tricky for me. Infinite means that something starts at some point in time, and it keeps going forever. That's hard to believe already because forever is it's very abstract, right? But in, when we're talking about infinite, we're saying that it has had a start. It just never ends. Eternal, on the other hand, it's way more complex. Eternal means it has had no start and it has no end. Let me repeat that. It has no start and no end. How does that sit with you? It blows my socks off. Because how can you possibly consider something that has no start and no end? 
our mind is so accustomed to the physical world, to the things that we see in nature, that we know that everything has a start. Everything is triggered by something else. It's the law of cause and consequence. It's Newton's thermodynamics, that every action, there is a reaction and so forth. But God, God is not in that context. God does not live in the physical world. We don't have, again, the mental furnishings to fully understand what God is. And we accept that in Spiritism. Doesn't mean that we don't try, like we said, because we must understand that by being something greater than ourselves, God is fully in control of our lives. So eternal is a tricky concept. If God is God, then God has had no beginning and no end. There was nothing before God. In fact, there was no when before God. This whole idea of time, and this is going to be very confusing, is something that God has created for us. If God was the first thing, then time didn't exist when God was there. Time must have come after God. So time is something that is not that God is not subject to. So for God, he can see everything at all times. And see how I just made a lapse there in my own language? I called he. Those are physical terms that we use. God is neither he nor she. But culturally, we have unfortunately associated God with he, right? Oftentimes, ostracizing the she. So I take that back and say, God has no pronoun. God is God. Right? But God is not within time. That's why God knows everything at once, which God must if God is God. Are you, is your mind melting already? Because my brain is already having a tough time understanding. It's, it's trying to plug our brains that are 110 volts into a 220 volts current. It's going to fry us. Because God is so much more than we can conceive that it makes it difficult for us to fully grasp it. But what we can grasp of God, no matter how small, is already very beautiful. But anyways, let's move on a little further. And to that end, we also know that God is one. It's unique. There can only be one God, whatever you call it. Because if there were two gods, then you have the question of what came first? And if one came before the other, then it would go against the idea of being eternal because they would have had a start. So, logically speaking, God is unique. There's only one God, no matter what you call it, whenever, whenever what I call it. God is also immutable. That's a very difficult one to understand for us here, too. God does not change. We change. Because God is perfect. If God is perfect, God has nothing else to learn. That's a really tough one for us to understand. Because everything in our world changes. We fight change, but everything in our world changes. God does not change at all. And in that manner, it makes us really complicated, complicating for us to fully understand the beauty of God. And if God does not change, it means that God, being all wise and all just and good as we're going to talk, God makes no mistakes. God must be, by definition, just and good. Because if God were not just and good, he, again, my mistake, God would be human. And God is more than that. So, how does it go? They say that we were created in his image, in God's image. Well, the problem is that sometimes we make God in our image. We try to understand God as we would behave. Because it's only normal that we try to understand the world with our own lens. But we got to push ourselves farther than that. And try to think from a different perspective. If God is all just and good, it means that everything is happening as it should. Which makes it really hard, sometimes, for us to truly look at the world around us and think, how can everything be unfolding as it should? There is so much violence. There is so much sadness out there. How can that possibly be? In fact, 
That's one of the questions I oftentimes get from people who want to believe in God but look at the world around them and have trouble reconciling what they perceive to be a state of chaos and the concept of a just and loving creator that oversees everything. Because I can also understand that from their perspective, if God is just sitting back and letting it all play, then it might seem like a mean thing. Then there must be no God. However, we have also learned to take the higher perspective, the higher vantage point in Spiritism. And because we have also learned through our experimentations that life goes beyond the physical body and that we come to this planet as many times as we need to continue our evolution, uh, and I'm talking about reincarnation here, we begin to understand that there is a series of causes and consequences that we must face from one life to the next. In fact, an interesting perspective here for us to have was very clearly defined by Allan Kardec who first codified Spiritism, and I think that he summon, summarized this in a, in a way that was really simple and powerful, and he said that every consequence has a cause. So everything that happened was caused by something. If we cannot see the cause of our current circumstances in this lifetime, then it must necessarily come from a previous lifetime. Almost as if you had walked into a movie theater halfway through the movie and all of a sudden you see somebody chasing somebody else and trying to hurt them. You would naturally think that the person being chased is the poor victim. But had you walked into that movie 30 minutes before, you would have seen that the person that's currently being chased was actually chasing the first person, slipped, fell, lost their baseball bat, I'm making things up here, run with me, um, and now the other person is running, chasing them back, right? If we don't see the whole picture, we might think that the world is out of place. But if we had the whole picture, which we don't, but God does, then we would understand the causes of different things. And we understand that it's not about punishment and revenge, it's about learning. That we sometimes have to learn through pain because we have not learned out of our own free will. So this is when we make a brief parenthesis here and say, and that is one of the reasons why we can see that there are many different people in many, many different circumstances in this lifetime. Let's be honest. If you stop to think about it, we're all born differently. We all have the same value, but we all born differently. Some of us have had the pleasure of, bo of being born in full, loving families. Others have come into broken homes. And it's harder to have a life when you're in a broken home. Some of us have had the pleasure of being born into a family of material wealth. Others have been born in abject poverty. Some of us have been born fully healthy, with a healthy body and a healthy mind. Some of us have been born without limbs. And so, if we believe only in one existence, as we sometimes are told by some people, then we struggle to reconcile that paradigm. Because if we believe the elephant that other people have inspected and tell us about, we are going to start to have trouble with the world around us when we see the elephant ourselves. Think about it for a second with me. If there were only one life, how do you judge somebody who has lived for five years versus somebody who has lived for 50 years or for 95 years? How do you judge and account for different starting points? Don't you think that there are different responsibilities for those who have been born with more than those who were born with less? How do you measure all of this? And can you truly and truly say that that person, based on those actions, deserve an eternity based in maybe a hundred years of their life? So can, can, you, can you reconcile in your mind the idea of eternity like we have struggled with? So imagine, imagine like thousands and thousands of years. Can you imagine judging somebody and condemning that person to a condition of 
peace or unrest for thousands and thousands and thousands of years based in five years? That seems very mean to me. That seems to go against the very concept of God as we're talking about. And I'll go a step further and then I will change directions. Imagine if you were a wonderful person and that you have now been, um, that you have passed, you are now in a, died in a different place, and imagine that there is such a thing as heaven and hell, as we have traditionally been told by some traditions. And you're in heaven, so to speak. Now, imagine that you had a son or a daughter who perhaps has not had a stellar life like you have had. And they find themselves in the other place, in the basement, as we like to sometimes think. And why do we think that heaven is up and hell is down? I have no idea. But these are ideas that we have been pushed, right? So explain to me that as a mother or a father or a guardian, you could live in eternal bliss knowing that those whom you love are not. In that system, there would only be hell. Because even if you were in heaven, you would be suffering constantly worried about those that you love. So clear, clearly, these old thinking methods that have stopped shy of advancing themselves are no longer suiting us. We need to reevaluate our misconceptions from the past to understand. Um, and the idea of reincarnation in that sense helps us move that idea of justice forward. And I cannot conceive of a God that is not just and kind. I just cannot. Because if I try to be loving to my children, how would God, who is infinitely more everything than I am of good, not do the same? Would I have higher standards than God? It it's, doesn't sound logical, feasible, or possible. So justice, our concept of justice is necessarily tied to God. And goodness as well. I cannot, for instance, um, I cannot rest uh, quiet. Whenever I hear, like, um, we are God-fearing people or the fear of God, I'm like, how could I possibly be afraid of God? What kind of God have we had in our minds? My God, the God that I know has created everything around, is a God of love. Why would I fear God? I don't fear my parents. I love them. And in, as a matter of fact, I want to do a parenthesis here because I think that uh, anthropologically speaking, that's something that us Christians, and I consider myself one, um, have failed to, to understand sometimes and make the leap. You see, before Christ, the idea of God was one of a punitive and vengeful God. We even see that through Moses. All the commandments are, don't do these things. Almost as if we are going to get our hands lapped like a child if we do those, anything of those Ten Commandments. But Jesus comes aboard and tells us something different. He gives us the law of love. He no longer tells us what not to do. He tells us instead what to do. Love your neighbor. Right? A new commandment I give you, a new commandment I leave you. Love one another as I have loved you. He even raises the bar. He's like, don't love each other as you want to be loved because you don't fully comprehend love yet. Let's raise the bar. Love others as I have loved you. So the shift towards love is one that's relatively recent in our religious history as a people. It's only been 2,000 years since we heard that beautiful message. It might sound like a, a lot of time for us who live for 40, 50, 60, 100 years, but in the grand scheme of 13 billion years of the universe, 2,000 years is pretty recent. So the concept of goodness in general, it's one that we must also think about because if our God is one that we should fear, then we're basically saying that we should have lives of fear and it's okay for us to terror terrorize other people. However, when we embrace a God of love, of goodness, we take on the ethical responsibility of treating everybody the same in terms of value and making sure that we are upholding justice and kindness 
everywhere, which personally is the legacy I believe the Christ has left us with. So how we look at the world and how we look at God, it's very, very important in many different ways. We may talk a little bit more about that. But before you fall fully asleep, because I know that these things are hard to comprehend and they might sometimes fry your brains because we are talking a lot of abstract things, we want to slide one and more in there. God is also immaterial. That seems obvious. Clearly God is not material because we can't see God. But it's important for us to talk a little bit about this because it's good for us to reinforce that which we already know. If God is immaterial, which means God is not material, it's not made of the materials that you, this podium, this chair, this TV, your TV, your device is made of, then God exists in a different realm. And when we start to think about this, we begin to really understand that some of the teachings that have come through Jesus make a lot more sense. My kingdom is not of this world, he said. That makes sense. It's not of this material world. So there is another realm that we all go to, the spiritual realm, after we live. And so if that is the case, then how does that change the lives we live today? Well, if, if the kingdom of God, if the origin and nature of God is not of this world and neither is ours because we are created by God, then this world is secondary to the spiritual world. That is a really tough pill to swallow because everything that we do in our lives tends to be directed towards this world. We try to advance in this world. We try to um, you know, get better positions, get more money, find comfort in this world. And sometimes we're really even willing to step on others to do it. We try to get all kinds of material benefits now because we ignore the existence of a different life. Now, when we begin to understand that God is immaterial, and when Christians like myself start to quote and say that my kingdom is not of this world, we are signing, we're undersigning the responsibility of thinking with our spiritual brains and saying, this experience that I'm having right now is a temporary one. It's only a matter of time until we return home to the spiritual realm. So, if this is akin to a day of work, where we go, we work for a day, we go back home, and next day we do it again, am I doing what I need to do here to go back home with a clean conscience? Am I really keeping my mind on what really matters, my own spiritual development and growth and that of others? Or am I just focused on the physical and now? This also explains why we have tried so desperately to find answers to our problems with material goods and those have not worked at all. You see, we have had so much comfort given to us by modern technology and overall development, but our hearts still missing something. Never in our history have we had so much ease on doing things. And yet, never in our history have we been so satis dissatisfied that our suicide rates are incredibly high. Never in the history of mankind have we had such great suicide rates. And, and I think that it's a direct connection to the times. We have fallen into the trap of believing that our only existence is that of a physical one, and we think that when things don't go well, we can escape it. But we can't escape our larger life. We might also find ourselves unhappy on the other side with the things that we weren't happy here. So we must address them here because they are going to follow us wherever we go. So the belief in a spiritual life has to go beyond our day-to-day -day living, has to go beyond our day-to-day -day thinking. Now, of course, I'm not saying go be a monk 
uh, out in the tallest mountain you can find and shy away from all responsibilities. That's not at all what we're saying. Of course, we must have a job. We must pay our mortgage. We must have, you know, deal with everything else. But we need to also pay attention that that is not a long-lasting situation that we find ourselves in, in, this, in this planet, that we must go on. So, thinking about God opens this can of worms, so to speak. It is the invisible elephant in the room that makes us reconsider what we are and where we are. And if we are immaterial beings as well, because we have come from God, then who I am today in this physical body might not be who I am next time around. And if that's the case, then who am I? Would I recognize myself without this clothing? And by clothing, I mean physical body. Would you recognize your friends without looking at them, without their voice? If we put them behind the screen, you know one of those TV screens where you can't hear what they say, you don't know what they look like, and they change their voice? Would you recognize who they are by how they are? Do we really know people for what they are? Or do we know them by what they look like? These are deeply troubling questions. Do we know ourselves? And all those questions come from our understanding of what is important, the material or the immaterial. And as we begin to understand that God is immaterial, God is of the spirit, and God created us in God's image, then we are spirits first, which means we are temporarily having a physical experience. Oftentimes I, I hear people say, oh, um, we have a soul, or oh, my spirit's feeling lonely. No, 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 you don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a body. It's the other way around, but we are so conditioned to thinking that we're a body that we think that we have a spirit, as if the spirit belonged to us. No, no, no. It's the opposite. We are thinking it's all backward. That's why it's so hard, because we put everything that's physical first, and spiritual second, and it's the other way around. So thinking about God lands us in that position, lands us into thinking about the world in general and trying to consider what is it that we should and need to reevaluate to lead more fulfilling lives. And how do we do that? That's all a exercise of intellectuality that we've done here. But I also want to take a moment to say that experiencing God is also an emotional state. And I pull one of my favorite psalms here. I know it's from the Old Testament, and I do prefer the New Testament, which I call the version 2.0, right? There's version 1.0 of, God, of God's teachings, which is the Old Testament. And I feel like then we've gotten an upgrade when Jesus came about, and so we have version 2.0. But version 1.0 still has some really good things. And in version 1.0, of God's words, so to speak, we find this beautiful psalm, Psalm 46, that says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Stop. Be quiet for a second. Go inside and feel the presence of God. Yes, you can hear and see God reflected in others, but you have to go inside and quiet your mind, make time for reflection to fully internalize. And that is so tough in our world today. We are running from place to place, paying attention on the outside. Most of us get in a car, we turn our radios on or whatever it is that you listen to. Very few of us take the time to sit and reflect. We value the wrong value sometimes. We think that being busy all the time is a good thing, but there has to be a moment for reflection. There has to be a moment for consideration of what we have gone through, analysis, and learning. That will not happen on the fly. We need to stop and ponder. So how often do you stop and ponder about God? How often do you stop and think about your life how frequently do you pause and consider how and if you are growing and where do you want to grow next? These are things that I feel are symbolized by our be still and know that I am God. We have to make time 
for the intellectual exercise of thinking, but also digesting, reflecting, so that we don't find ourselves just taking in other people's perception of the world without seeing whether that is our perception or not, whether we want to hold that through or not. Nowadays, I think that kind of behavior is everywhere. We read the newspapers and we just believe what we read. Where is our critical thinking? Where is our sense of discernment, of saying, I don't know if I truly believe this. We only do that when it suits us. That's not how it's intended to be. We've got to be critical of everything, including ourselves. But we move on as well, because it's also important for us to look God as a whole and think that as God becomes the source of all our thinking, all our conceptions, that we need to spend more time thinking about all of that. We need to spend more time really finding out who we are and what we are about. We should not worry about what other people are and what they are about. I know we want to, and honestly, our desire oftentimes is to control them because if I'm honest with you, all of you guys are the problem. I'm okay. It's just all of you that make my life miserable. If only all of you behave the way I want you to believe, whoa, this would be great, right? But there's a flaw in that because there's one of me and there's seven billion of you. And I bet the other six billion, nine hundred and ninety-nine million, and there he goes, think the same way. And in that situation, we are never going to get anywhere. However, when we realize that change means us first, then we're in business. Because what we really want is, we want everybody to change, but we don't want to change. And we got to stop thinking that way. We got to say, what is the only thing that I can control and barely? Myself. What other people do, it's none of our concern. It might hurt us, it might make us happy, but ultimately, we can only affect ourselves. Do we want other people to change? To change? Sure we do. Can we make them change? We cannot. We can perhaps ask, we can model behavior, but we just have to accept people as they are. That is really tough. But God accepts us who, who we are as we are. And if we are in God's image, then we must do the same to other people. Those are tough, tough pills to swallow. But we must. Because they will make us happy. Because they will set us free. And that's exactly where we go. When we have a more balanced and center perception of the world and of the cosmos, we will be happy with ourselves. And I wonder if that is what Jesus meant when we find in John chapter 8 in the New Testament, verses 32, he says, you will know the truth with a capital T and the truth will set you free. When we better understand the spiritual realm in God and the fact that God transcends our understanding, that God is incredibly loving beyond our capacity to fully internalize that and that God is incredibly just beyond our ability to understand it and that God gives us as many chances as we need to make things right and if not in this lifetime in the next when we begin to understand that we are not our physical bodies that we are spirits we start to be more tolerant with other people too because they too are not what we just see they're more than that they are the accumulation of all their actions and activities in previous lives. So we must be more tolerant, just like we want us and our shortcomings to be understood. If God can love us so much as to let us make and take our own decisions, why wouldn't we extend that courtesy to others? Why wouldn't we also let others do what they think is best? It's a fundamentally diff difficult thing to do in a different perspective as well because it really starts changing the way we behave in a practical way. But when we are able to make peace with that, then we start to worry less about what other people are thinking. Worry less about what we should be for other people. 
None of that matters. What, is, what matters is what do you want to be? And are you going to be better today than you were yesterday? What other people do or don't do might hurt you, but will not define your happiness. Your happiness cannot be attached to other people. Your happiness will not be found exclusively in this physical world because that's not where we truly live. This is a temporary place. It's an assignment that we go to to learn things. Happiness is not of this world, our older brother Jesus said. It can be in this world, but it's not of this world, which means it's not given or gotten by things that are physical and material. Nevertheless, happiness is there and it's a promise to all of us. And so when we begin to understand the love that is there, that is manifest through our many lifetimes, we also begin to think of the universal family and support that we have. Think about it. If all of us have lived many lifetimes, we have had many different fathers and mothers and cousins and friends and colleagues and partners and pets and what have you. And all that love never ends because love is not of this world. Love continues. So when we think we're lonely, we don't remember that all that love is out there for us. And there's an incredible amount of love for us. So we hope that more and more, as you consider your own personal life, as you consider your own experiences, that you take the time to reflect on what God is and use all the tools that you have and a wonderful tool is spiritism, as we said, that helps us get there but that you make your own decisions because it's your life that you must decide how to live. Of course, please also lend a hand to those around you because after all, we are here with them as well and we will see them again as well. But don't forget ever that you are loved beyond your ability to understand it. And God is always with you and always loves you no matter when and no matter what. And we hope to see you soon and another opportunity. God bless you.